<laughs> All right, thanks for uh, coming and hello to everyone online. Uh, this is a project that we undertook last summer uh, along with George here, uh, one of our PhD alumni, uh, Chun, who's at Ryerson now, and uh, another analyst in my lab, Manuel. Um, we're looking at developing a surface wipe sampling method for a variety of antineoplastic drugs. Um, it's just some background for you. Uh, the risks associated with occupational exposure to these kinds of drugs have been reported since the 1970s. Um, and ex the exposure can result in genetic damage, toxic reproduc reproductive effects, cancer. I mean, these, these compounds are used to treat cancer, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a nasty treatment, and they are, in fact, dangerous to people administering them. Um, there's some factors to consider here in Canada. We have a, you know, aging baby boom population. The rate of certain cancers are increasing, so per capita increasing. Um, that means more treatments being administered. Uh, we have more combinations of drugs being used, like a, a tailored cocktail for different types of cancers. Uh, we have uh, more decentralization of drug delivery, um, rather than just a centralized pharmacy in a hospital and an oncology unit. We have community clinics and commercial pharmacies um, preparing these compounds. Um, and that ties into there's more job titles at risk than just nurses and pharmacists. Uh, in studies, you know, that have been done on this in the last, say, since the mid-90s, you know, we've seen contamination in shipping and receiving, in portering, in patient care areas, doors, elevators, like, not to scare you, but all over the place. And, and in fact, you know, the, the vials themselves, when they come into the hospital, already have often contamination on the outside of the packaging just from the facility. Um, some papers have looked at that. So th this is just to say, you know, we need, we need to look at this. Um, as, the, as the usage of these increases, the occupational risk will continue to be a concern. And there are control measures. This right here is a type of closed transfer device where you can do dilutions and combinations of solutions um, without having your stuff out in the open air. It's all enclosed, and that does work pretty well. Um, but uh, there have been studies on facilities with different types of control measures that still had detectable contamination. So that's just a starting point for what we're doing. And so what's needed? is a consistent sampling method that can be systematically applied. Um, there's little standardization in the literature about sampling methodology. You'll see all different types of, of wipes and swabs and different things being done in different ways, and, and it's not very systematic. Um, having an extro exposure control plan means that you do have to have a standard way to evaluate contamination. You want to compare it between hospitals. You want to compare it between years. Uh, it has to be standardized. Um, we'd like to capture a number of common drugs. Um, and we would also like the method to be able to be applied by health and safety personnel at the facility, whether they work for the health authority, the facility itself. Um, if we develop a lab method that's only applied and tested in a lab, by an analytical chemist or whatever, that's only of moderate interest. We, we need to actually get in there and, and make sure that this can be applied by someone. So a, a lot of um, research on this is focused on the theory of like an indicator compound. Like you look at the, the um, contamination of cyclophosphamide, for example, is the most prevalent one. And you say, okay, well, we know how much cyclophosphamide is administered, do some calculations. This is a indicator for overall contamination. But as more and more different types of drugs and amounts are, are administered, that, that doesn't really do. We'd actually like to know what, what is the contamination on the surface of not just cyclophosphamide, but, but platin drugs and taxol drugs and vinca alkaloid drugs and, and other things. Um, We'd like to achieve a lower detection limit 
currently this is all in the as low as reasonably achievable principle. There's a suggested regulation or a suggested number for cyclophosphamide contamination, but there's no actual regulation. There's no numbers. There's just one amount that's been thrown out there, um, and, and it's not binding in any way. Um, we want, as I said, this to be flexible and work for a wide variety of compounds. Um, and, and I'll show you a slide with some of the compounds. Th these aren't necessarily all related. There's a lot of different types of chemically different, different drugs here. Um, we want it to be a, a, a practical method. We want it to be upfront with how it works, what doesn't work. Like We want this to be able to be realistically applied. And, and additionally, in some commercial labs, this is done to different degrees. You, you can get this analysis done by two or three places in Canada and one place in the States, but it's not very characterized. It's, you, you don't really get much information about it, and it's quite expensive. So we, we'd like to improve on that. This is just the six compounds that we did in this study. Um, we basically a we asked around with some contacts, uh, pharmacy oncology stakeholders in Canada, and we got a list of their most wanted, basically, their top 10 most frequently administered antineoplastic drugs. And from that list, we just, we just took some. That This was basically dictated by time and budget. We thought we could do you know, multiple drugs, and we decided to do these six. So you'll see that you have a small, relatively small, very polar compound like 5-fluorouracil. Well, that has a lot of method development implications because that's going to be quite different from vincristin or paclitaxel, which are larger organically derived um, compounds. Um, just to give you a visual, we this is on high flow or high pressure liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry. So we have here basically a, a very expensive pump <laughs> that just pumps liquid through at a known flow rate. Okay, and you have a separation column similar to any other type of chromatography. Um, that will separate your compounds out over time. After that, it goes to a mass spectrometer. And right here, at the tip of the nebulizer, it sprays out your compounds in a very fine aerosolized mist. And they're drawn into here under high vacuum. And they're basically ionized, broken up into chunks. And the way that they break is a fingerprint, is signature to each compound. So this allows, this is why we can look at multiple things at the same time. Um, so the basic method development, we want to quantitatively wipe a surface. We want to get all the compounds that we can off that surface. And then off of that wipe, we want to extract it. We want to run it on the instrument. We want every step to be quantitative because we want to actually give a number for what the I guess, nanogram per square centimeter contamination was on that surface. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, which material are you going to use to wipe? How are you going to wipe? What solvent? How should it be applied? I mean, you can imagine you could have your wipe and solvent separate. You put the liquid on the surface and wipe it. Or you have a wet wipe. There's a variety of things. How do we extract it? Um, you don't want to do something too vigorous. You could actually degrade the, the compounds that are sitting there on the wipe. And then I won't get into the super technical mass spec analysis, but that is another aspect of it, especially mainly affecting the d limited detection, so how low you can, you can detect these contaminations. Um, with, within each step, you need controls and comparisons, and it, everything needs to be well characterized along the way. Uh, but at the same time, you can only go so deep for each step, just like what's practical. I can't sit there for a whole month and optimize just how I extract one thing from a wipe. It's, it, it would, you can just get ridiculous. Um, and there's a lot of details here. 
that I'm going to not go over. We did publish the full paper on this. It's, if you want to know any of the technical stuff, read the paper, come talk to me. There's lots more information. Um, so, not that you all are necessarily going to have to do this or anything, but I think it's interesting to see what goes into a method development like this. Now, every method that you've used, a NIOSH method, an OSHA method, someone has done something similar to this, tried a bunch of stuff, and most of it didn't work, and you do various iterations. This just kind of give you an idea of what's behind a method development like this. So, for example, we'll try different desorption solutions. This, this is uh, I should have mentioned that at this point I, we're not wiping anything. I'm just taking these compounds, putting them right onto a, a wipe and desorbing them just to see, you know, can I get it off of there? Because say uh, it gets it off the surface, but I can't get it off the wipe. That's useless. So we'll try different solutions, different ratios of water, methanol, acetonitrile, whatever else. Um, Ultrasonication, which is what is just a picture of a sonicator here. Uh, centrifugation, vortexing, filtration, a variety of things. Um, basically, we came up with 50 50 water methanol and ultrasonication followed by centrifugation. Uh, vortexing, which is where you basically, the whole sample kind of vibrates very quickly, that actually tears the filter apart. And you get all these little tiny filter particulates, and it's a pain to deal with. So we skip that. Ultrasonication actually uses cavitation. So it, it uses ultrasonic waves to induce very small bubbles in the liquid. Um, and that's uh, a, a good method for, for kind of desorbing stuff off of this physical wipe. Um, and Good results on that, other than 5-fluorouracil um, and oxaliplatin, we had basically 100% recovery for all the other stuff. So that tells us when you wipe a surface and get something on your wipe, we can get it off the wipe and then analyze it. Um, so it actually kind of worked backwards because you have to figure that out before you do the wiping. Um, Kim wipe tissue, which is a... Uh, Maybe you've seen them. It's like a thin cellulose fiber, uh, supposed to not have any lint or any um, little bits on it. Uh, it's been used before, but we found it had a background interference with 5-FU. Um, so something on there in the manufacture process, we don't really know when you run it, even a blank filter or even a blank tissue, you get, you get results. You get a peak there. Um, not that it has 5-FU on it, but it has something that interferes. So we had to just drop that immediately. Uh, we went with Wattman. These are also cellulose, but a different process, and they're a bit thicker. Um, they kind of can absorb more liquid. Um, now we, we, we tested a couple things here. This is, I mean, this is really the heart of the wipe procedure, because this is how is the person actually going to do this in the hospital. And it, it makes quite a difference. Um, you want the solvent to be on there because the interaction between the solvent and the compound on the table is actually what's bringing it up into the wipe. It's not really the physical, like, rubbing it on there. Um, you you want to figure out how to do this. So some studies have had the solvent and the wipe separate and you put the solvent on the surface, you make sure that that is really getting on there, and then you wipe it off. But just thinking about that, you know, not from a perspective of how do we get the highest percentage, but how is this going to be used, that's not super useful because you want to wipe doorknobs, you want to wipe the side of a chair, you want to wipe anything, anything that's not a perfectly horizontal surface you can't do that on. So that's, you know, even if I have seen papers that have gotten a good percentage doing that, we thought, well, we're not going to do that. that. That's kind of of little use to us actually in the hospital. So, so we decided to go with a wipe that is kind of pre-prepared. We'll send them when someone does this sampling, you know, a vial containing the wipe with the proper solution, everything. You just take it out and use it. That seemed easiest to us. Uh, we tried wiping twice, you know, 
maybe if we only get 70% the first time, we do it again, we get 70% of that, you know, remainder. Wiping twice with the same filter actually decreased recoveries. You start to physically abrade the filter. It starts to fall apart. You see it on the surface. It's actually worse. Um, you can wipe with the second filter, so this would actually be doing two separate samples, that only increases the recovery incrementally. So some compounds, nothing, some compounds up to 20%, but you're doubling the cost of analysis here. And that's, that's a big hurdle because most people looking to do this, you know, I've had a couple uh, people in Canada, different health authorities call me wanting to do this. Their biggest barrier is always the cost of analysis because LCMS analysis is expensive. So, I mean, this, I guess, is an option that someone could do in the future if, if they're really interested, but we did not include this in our method because doubling the cost for just incremental recovery was not worth it to us. Um, we uh, also just note our filter is a 70 millimeter filter and it's cut in half. It's just a shape that works well for how we fold it up and, and do it. So the actual, well, here's the protocol. Um, it's wetted with, again, a mixture of water and methanol. The actual performance of it, this is kind of the numbers that you would compare to other papers or other methods. Um, we tested it on some older, this was all in stainless steel. We just did stainless. Um, uh, lots of papers have done additional things that you would see like uh, laminate wood like this, linoleum tiles, etc. Just resources and time. We just had the, we just did stainless which is the most common one. Uh, and we, but we did do two different types of stainless. We got some new 204 stainless from just on campus here from the mech shop. And then we used some older plates of the same stuff, but had been used for multiple experiments before, had been cleaned multiple times. And you could kind of just see looking at them that they were a bit more worn or dirty or what have you. Um, so this here that I've circled, that's like the, that's really the result. And on average, pretty good recoveries. And this is overall. This is including your desorption, running on the instrument, uh, how much you, everything. So you can see we have, I'd say anything in the 60 to 70 range and above is quite good for thinking about like actually getting something off a surface all the way into your instrument. You can see we have a couple. Methotrexate is only at 25%. That's not too good. 5 if is only at 45%. That is comparable to what other people have seen, though. Just different things on different surfaces have innate characteristics. However, compare this to we did the exact same type of testing on the plates that were more worn. You'll see a dramatic difference. Um, you know, a lot of them half half the recovery. Um, and so we thought, okay, what's the actual difference? Is it the chemistry of it? What is it? We don't necessarily know this, but we did take a profilometer, which is basically a little tiny, tiny stylus that goes along the surface of something, and you get a surface roughness profile. So we actually have, we went for the plates and calculated their surface roughness, and as we expected, the worn plates had a much higher average surface roughness. So our suggestion, we think this probably corresponds just to the roughness of the surface. Um, I guess just the wiping action is less efficient, the rougher the surface is, which makes sense. But but this has this has a you know an implication which I'll which I'll get to in a bit. Um, but we want to know some things even after we have that number, which is I guess your main point of information usually is a recovery. That's like most, most studies that do this. You get to the recovery, you publish the recoveries. OK, we're good. Um, but when you're actually applying this, there's a lot of other things we want to know. Like, is the wipe stable, or rather, how stable is it? So does the stuff that you've sampled degrade on the wipe after you've sampled it? Or do the compounds sitting there on the surface degrade on the surface between contamination and sampling? Well, we kind of already know the answer to that is yes, they do to some extent, but we want to quantify it. Uh, some compounds, like say doxorubicin, are known to be light sensitive. Um, and is the extracted sample stable? So after we've done our whole procedure and we just have something sitting on the instrument, 
is that going to be stable? Um, so we assessed explicitly question one here in our study, do compounds degrade on the wipe after sampling? We tested that theoretically in the lab. We also just replicated that by boxing up samples and shipping them to Toronto and back just to see what happened. And we, the finding there is basically if you're, if you're doing like a, a cooled shipment, so below 10 degrees, basically you're just taking a cooler, putting ice packs in there and shipping your samples, and you're doing it within 24 or 48 hours, not exceeding 48 hours, there's no difference seen. So that's a nice result. It tells us that if we have you know, hospitals wherever else in Canada, they can ship samples to us within 48 hours and those samples are okay. That's good to know. Uh, the last one here about the extracted sample, we kind of indirectly address that just in our routine quality control stuff on the instrument. The extracted samples are quite stable. Um, the middle one here, we have not addressed yet. We just didn't have the time to do it. We plan to do it in the future. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, also, this is quite interesting because m most, I guess some occupationally focused papers probably have, have looked at this before, but nothing in the antineoplastic analysis kind of realm has this, I mean, it's kind of a dense graph, so I just copied this out of the paper. Basically, each group here is one compound and a kind of comparable test. So in theory, if all of these are this, and, and, and within this, this is different people doing the same thing. So we just pulled some people out of their offices up here and just gave them the instructions and let them go. And then the research assistant who had done the most wiping um, is on there as assistant. I'm on there as internal personnel. You can't use anyone's name in the, in the paper. Um, what we see here is that it can, it can be quite variable depending on the person doing the wiping. They're following the same instructions. You know, they're theoretically doing the same thing, but the results are not the same. And it's not random. Like, the, the, it, it's replicable. So you'll see that the person on the left here who has the highest recovery, you know, generally has that every time. Like, there's an there's a actual trend here. Um, so this is not that surprising, given that that's the person who had the most experience doing this. But it... it you can see that on some of these, the, the lower ones here are, you know, maybe half or only 60% of, of the recovery. This just shows us that we need to be aware of this and that doing the procedure properly and training and, and stuff like that is very important. To be fair to these people who got low recoveries, they had no training. We just pulled them in and just said, okay, do it, because we wanted to see, you know, how that would turn out. Um, So, let's see. Yeah, I just wanted to go over here what, well, let me go back actually. Sorry. So what, what this shows combined with the variability from surface to surface, um, the, the background here is that a lot of papers in this area kind of endeavor to just create kind of a matrix where you would have the compound on one axis and you would have the surface on another axis and you can just look it up and say, okay, Ben Kristen on glass, recovery is 30%. Uh, that approach just isn't going to work. In the future, if, if you're a hygienist trying to calculate stuff, that is not a good way to do it because it's so variable you know, if your recovery is 90 versus 10 percent, you know, potentially, you can't just assign a value because one person did it one time. And although that isn't explicitly stated by anyone, that's definitely my interpretation of it because that's what a lot of these papers tend towards is just generating that matrix so you, so you know what it is. We're suggesting you actually have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so we've, we've looked at the wiping, we've looked at the extraction and the analysis. Well, 
kind of skipped over the analysis. Um, that's a more boring part. Uh, so these were the original goals. Expand the analysis to more than one or two drugs. Okay, we've done that. Uh, achieve a lower detection limit. Um, we were pretty successful with that, uh, with a couple of the drugs, um, methotrexate and 5-FU. We got pretty much the same level as people usually get, and the other ones we all pushed lower. Um, pushing it lower is nicer because then you can actually detect kind of background contamination that isn't necessarily like a big contamination event has happened, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, so you, you can actually get a feel for what the levels are all over the place and not have 80% of your samples all be below LOD, which as a chemist is valid, but hygienists don't like. And then other goals to have the sample preparation and the whole thing be, be pretty flexible. And so we've done that. We, we could optimize this more for any specific drug or, or group of drugs. We kind of kept it middle of the road. So, so we could add just about any compounds to this analysis with a little bit of, with a little bit of footwork. And, and we also picked compounds that are kind of representative of a family. So like vincristin, we did that successfully so we could likely add any of the other vinca alkaloid drugs. There's vinblastin, vindesin, a lot of other analogs. Similar to cyclophosphamide, there's other phosphamide drugs, there's other um, platin drugs, et cetera. Um, so I, we were pretty successful in, in that. Overall, we're suggesting that real-world usage requires a lot of controls and data to to get the to get the results. Um, I don't even know if you can read this from out here. Probably this is the kind of table I was talking about where we'll have like a drug versus surface recovery matrix kind of, and you'll see here like say vincristin stainless steel. Okay, they got 50%. That's okay. 12% precision. That's okay. But if you compare this to our results with the same compound on stainless steel, we got a totally different result. So if you're actually applying this as a correction factor to get quantitative data, we're arguing you, you have to do this case by case. Um, there's, there's vincristin here. This is the different personnel doing it, so compounding the, the different surfaces. You can see there's a lot of variability. So we are going to continue applying this method. And knowing that this recovery can vary with all of these things, um, any application of the method has to consider these factors. Uh, beyond a published paper that just works as advertised, which is you know, rare enough on its own that you actually just plug in all the numbers and the values and your instrument just goes. Um, you have to pay attention to what's happening in the field, what's happening on the site. Um, and so in our, in our future work, well, really it's current work now, uh, we, uh, with George and some other folks, have a WorkSafe BC Innovation at Work grant to continue this. Um, it, it, we're doing I, basically field evaluation of the method. We're, we're going to go apply this um, at a couple different facilities. Um, we're going to try to put on a couple additional compounds. Uh, like I discussed, it can be you know, expanded. We're going to attempt to do that. Uh, we're going to develop the additional stability data that I mentioned earlier that we're missing. And also, importantly, we're going to develop the sample kit. Now, this is kind of just a practical matter rather than a, a chemistry one, but we've seen that this needs to be applied in a very careful way. And so we're working to come up with kind of a self-contained kit, has everything for doing the controls, for the wiping, for the blanks. It has the, uh, you know, the, the solutions in the right concentration and instructions, everything all integrated together. Um, basically right now, if you send away to one of the few places that will do this, you'll get a vial with some sort of solution, some sort of wipe or swab, and instructions that are basically just like, you know, prepare the surface, put a template, wipe it. 
uh, pretty pretty basic. And if we want quantitative analysis here, if we want reliable results, and we want people to actually make the exposure control plans that they want to make, that that's not going to do. Um, so we're working with some other uh, people on the grant to help with the knowledge translation there and figuring out how to word it. Um, because last time I wrote the instructions and they were super chemisty and the people didn't understand them. So <laughs> uh, that's part of the the future work. Also, the the key thing being that we suggest that at each facility they're going to have to do a control for each surface. We can't just do stainless steel in the pharmacy and say, okay, we know it's 50% for this, 30% for this. If they want to do laminate, they're going to have to do a control on laminate. If they want to do glass, they're going to have to do a control on glass. That increases the number of samples and the cost, unfortunately, by a bit. But by doing that and applying this method, considering all the quality control data that we've done, that will actually allow these facilities to get quantitative numbers uh, which is what we are after. Um, and that's what I've got. I'd be happy to take questions. That is super interesting. Okay. I have a zillion questions if nobody else does, but I think, I think other people do too, unfortunately. Thanks. Um, so I'm curious about this uh, interperson variability. And of yeah. course, there's also the variability uh, with, with the matrix. Have you thought of incorporating into your sampling strategy having um, an inert substance that would be added to the surface before you take the wipe that would act just the way that you do once it's in the machine to um, you know, as an internal control. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is a great idea, and that is done in by some people um, uh, by using, like, say, uh, isotopically labeled substances or what have you, because you want something that won't be in the ambient environment. You know, like your tracer gas stuff that won't be in the ambient environment. You can analyze, and then you know, okay, I only got 20% of that back. I'll adjust it upwards. The caveat being we were just having a hard time convincing people or making a plan that will allow us to go around and contaminate stuff as we wipe. Really, that, that's the reason, because that is that would be the, like numerically the best way to do it. And I am totally open to doing that in the future. But in our current project, we kind of floated that idea. And the people from the health authority were just like, I know that makes sense, but that's going to be onerous to, to get that approved. Uh, first of all, Maddie, I just want to say how exciting it is that there is someone doing this kind of work in our lab. I think it's so great. Thanks. Um, but my question was about the uh, second wipe, that uh, you had a first wipe and then a second wipe, and you said that that would be too expensive to uh, do two analyses. Mm -hmm. But I wondered why you couldn't put those two wipes together, extract them together, and then analyze them, the extract together. You're, that is potentially possible. That's, there's nothing inherently preventing that from happening. Um, you would need to extract it with more solvents. Um, when you, I, I didn't think it would be worth it because you would have to extract with twice as much solvent. So it, that pushes your LOD down by 0.5. And so I didn't think the recovery aspect of getting that much more percent was worth it. But say we had our LODs really low and we weren't worried about that, that could potentially that could potentially happen. Yeah. Uh, Ed had a question? Is anybody working on blood tests for these uh, materials that people pick up in, in their hospitals? I couldn't tell you that, George, or perhaps Avital would be a better answerer of that because I'm totally on the just analytical side here. Yeah. The common biological 
example, is is uh, urine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We have, yeah, that's what Chun, Chun the yeah. co-investigator on this project, that's what his thesis or some of his work was on was urinary metabolites of some of this stuff. So it is looked at that they are picking it up and it's in their body. Okay, I'm going to ask one of my questions as I move across the room because sure. we have lots of time. Um, how important is it to get the you know, exact numeric concentrations, or is it just important to know that this area is more contaminated than that area and we know that they're all contaminated? That's a good question, and I guess that's for the person designing kind of the monitoring to decide. Um, and, and they could just worry about this area is more contaminated than this area. But the goal of my thing here was to actually provide an avenue for doing the numerical type thing because that wasn't hasn't really previously been possible and so sure people may not decide to do it that way but if they want to do it this way they are able to thanks Maddie that was um, very clear presentation I'm I'm pretty clear you listed the kind of three elements for the sampling method and it's clear to me that the storage and the um, delivery you have a mechanism to reduce the error or variability there. Right. I, I'm curious where you think the greatest error lies in terms of the wipes or in terms of the tester. Those are the other two, kind of the assessor or the, um, I can't remember what the I label think, was, so I, there's some data that we didn't show here, just not get too deep into it, but we looked at the same person also doing it day to day and does that vary? And that was actually pretty stable. So my inclination would be to say if we have someone who's well trained on it and understands what they're doing that that actually isn't a huge source of error. I mean the one of the things I'm most worried about is and this would be so hard to know this for sure but when you detect something on a surface you know has it how long has it been there has it been degrading what does that correspond to what it really tells you is just what that was right then um, so that's kind of unknown. I have a high amount of confidence in in basically everything else in there. The the shipping and stability and stuff definitely is a concern and that you need to pay attention to it. But I don't think it we're actually losing much um, you know accuracy there. And second question: Help me understand the interpersonal variability. So when I looked at that graph. Yeah. Not being somebody who develops these methods, um, the recovery percent, when it was low, was low for all of them, if you will, and when it was high, it tended to be high for all of yeah, them. Yeah. So that's oh, wait, continue. Yeah, sorry. So I'm, I get that there's variability within a drug, but there's also something, at least to me, that the, the the variability, the bigger variability is from drug to drug, not person to person. Yeah, that that's also true, but but that's that's known. We it would, you know methotrexate is, um, you can look at all the papers and see it has pretty low recovery everywhere, and so that's not a surprise to me. And we're not really concerned with drug versus drug because they're each doing their own unique thing. The I guess the key thing would be look at like on Vincristin, this person here versus this person. Or, you know, this person versus this person here. Um, really just within the drug. Um, that's, that's the important thing. It's kind of a dense graph because it's pulled out right from the middle of a paper where it was all like explained. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that kind of drug dependent variability between uh, yeah. individual assessors. So it looks like the V1, Vintocristin, Vincristin yeah. is, and and the OX1, like, you know, those look quite different from the others. What are the characteristics of those drugs that might mean that somebody with lesser training would recover less than, than the people with better training? I can't say exactly what the characteristics would be, but it's it's actually, it's because of the chemistry of them. So polarity or um, whatever, I don't know, hydrogen bonding, just surface, if, if, how much aromaticity they have, I guess. Various chemistry interacting with the surface. That's all I can really say. 
I agree though, like for CP, you see, okay, well, all of them are fairly good versus here, it's like pretty drastic. I, I can't say exactly what the factors are, but it's, it's definitely just the different chemistries of each drug and that surface. Like you'll see for, for glass, for instance, we didn't do glass here. Glass is completely polar. It's covered with silanols, so silicon OH groups all over it. 5-FU is very polar. You'll see that 5-FU on glass has recoveries of like below 10% all the time. And so that's like an easy one to figure out there. So, but um, are, are the untrained personnel not wiping as hard or as slowly or as what? They're not wiping as hard or as evenly, okay. just from my observations. Okay. Like someone who is, it, so we put down a template, 10 by 10 centimeters, so about yay big, and you want to wipe well, like all of the template. And so maybe you're just wiping the center and you're not putting as much pressure. If you're better at it, you put like basically exactly the right amount of pressure so you're pushing really hard but you're not tearing anything or smudging it. It's, it's you know, that's as far as we can figure out. You just get better at applying it more evenly over the whole surface, yeah. Uh, thanks, Maddie. That's really interesting. Um, just what you said about surfaces in, in binding, um, would that then imply that you should use or not use certain surfaces in a pharmacy setting where you're dispensing these drugs? Like if you say a uh, glass surface tends to has a very high retention rate, does yeah. that imply then that that surface is safer for a user to be working around? That, the, I'll give you my opinion on that, though my answer, I don't really have any authority on this necessarily. Uh, I would say yes, yeah. I would say glass is less preferable in that sort of situation because it's going to grab onto everything polar and keep it on there. And, but in pharmacies, it's pretty much all stainless on the preparation surface, surfaces and stainless out of all the materials tested in these kinds of things usually has the best you know, recovery, like it lets stuff off the easiest. Mm -hmm. and, and my other question would be what, and I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you're the, if this is too off topic, but where would this recovery rate compare to the levels of concern? So are you being able to pick up levels of some of these drugs that are so low, if you say, okay, we've got this drug, but there's so little of it here, you don't have to worry about it. Right. Or is that level of concern below even the worst of your recovery yeah, yeah. rates? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Uh, so it varies per drug uh, because every the LOD varies per drug. So for example, 5-FU here, our detectable concentration is versus actual contamination is pretty high. So if you're detecting it, like you should be worried, you know what I mean? Whereas, I mean, well, there, it's all on the Alera principle. So I guess if I'm reporting contamination to people anywhere, they should be worried about it. But um, I guess that's why we need more work on this because we need something to compare it to. Right now we're worried about any detection, but certainly like I can detect Vincristin two orders of magnitude below I can detect 5-FU. And so it is possible what you're saying, but I don't have any limit to really to compare it against to say that, if you know what I mean. So I guess more a suggestion, next time you do this, would it be possible and practical to measure the force that a person's applying when they're doing their wiping and compare from person um, to person? Probably, in some way. Have the surface on a scale? So you yeah, if we, if we were to just uh, try and isolate that part of it and do a little project, we could, yeah, we could devise some sort of scale type thing. I, I don't see why not. Yeah. Yeah. Just thought. Yeah. Might make for more, might make for more effective training if you could say you have to. You right. Have to sure. So if, if if we kind of have someone who's really good at it, do it a couple times and see what they're doing and compare it and yeah. Yeah. I see that. Yeah, for sure. Jesse, had a question back there. Thank you. Um, my question was very similar to Aaron's. So do you know, do these drugs have like a no observable effect level? 
and like has that been compared to the LOD and so like we know it's safe if it is an LOD or not kind of Well thing? so these oh George can we that hasn't really been established yet. I mean, we, Maddie's referred to uh, the cancer risk, but there's also re reproductive uh, issues as well. So um, uh, uh, these uh, are uh, serious uh, reproductive, uh, uh, there are serious hazards associated with, with the exposure to these in terms of uh, the reproductive health of nurses, uh, male and female. And uh, so, you know, what that specific level is uh, ha has not been established. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, they're, they're all well known, like, uh, pharmacologically, but for, like, n contamination on a surface or anything, there's no, you know, we're assuming that it's dermal absorption and it's getting in the body, but we don't, yeah, there's not, not a lot of data for that. Thank you. Um, are there any specific cleaning agents currently used that are known to be able to take away or effectively clean these surfaces? And then with the knowledge that you've gained here about the retention and how it depends on the type of surface, could different cleaning agents depending on drug and surface also be developed? That is an awesome question because that's like a whole field of stuff that <laughs> that some of our students have done before. We had a, a master's student do exactly that about the cleaning agents. Um, I would say that's pretty understudied. They will just have um, usually a mixture of organic water, uh, organic solvent, you know, methanol or isopropyl water, and a detergent. Um, and it's sold sometimes under various trade names, although I just heard that one of them is discontinued that the hospital used. And they use the same procedure for everything. They don't have, you know, from, well, I'm no expert on this, but from what I've seen, no, there's not a lot of, not a lot of good data on that. Uh, there's the potential for it. Really, there just needs to be a bit more work on on um, cleaning solvents for this because it's very related to this but not quite the same results because you don't care about recovering it you just want to get it off the surface and there is some work on that um, definitely um, I would say that most of the hospitals are just using a pretty basic um, procedure and, and I got the procedure from the places that we're working with for this current project, and, and they're quite similar. Um, I guess I could make suggestions, but really it comes down to what's actually practical to apply there at a facility. Like, are they going to have different solutions or cleaning agents for all these different things or, you know, stuff like that. The biggest difference would probably just be to clean it really well, do it multiple times, I don't know, you know, I don't I don't have any any specific thing there. George had input on that. Uh, sorry, I was just going to ask how does the recovery rate of your you talked about using certain types of wipes because they didn't interfere with the recovery yeah, process. Right. When you pass these wipes over the surface, obviously how you do it is important, but how does that compare to how efficiently someone's skin is going to pick up the substance from a surface. Like, is the wipe much more sensitive than skin is, or is it comparatively insensitive versus skin? That is a good, that's a great question. We basically just have not addressed that. We're just looking at, can we even see what's on the surface? And work about, okay, we know what's on the surface, what's actually gonna happen dermally, would basically have to follow that. My inclination would be that the wipe is more, more absorbent or sensitive than skin because we're purposefully, you know, putting a, a mixture of water and methanol on there that we know will pick up stuff really well. And purposefully, you know, you're not like going like this along the whole surface with your hand. So, but th that, yeah, I, 
that would have to come after this stuff is more figured out, I'd say. Although getting volunteers to uh, yeah. self-expose <laughs> yes. uh, might, might be a, a tough one. Uh, the uh, Grad students, yeah, they, <laughs> they might. Um, the, the, just to comment on the cleaning, the, the one thing to keep in mind about cleaning is that uh, in hospitals they're driven by uh, infection control protocols. So it's not about actually wiping the surface off. Uh, they're mostly concerned about contact time. And if it's a disinfecting agent, what they'll do is wet the surface and then actually, by uh, uh, protocol, let it dry. So uh, our, our belief is that, in fact, they're not removing uh, these agents, that, that what's happening is they're redistributing them and, uh, and making them even more available, uh, and that, that there's a net buildup yeah. uh, over time. Okay. The the procedure that we got from from Viha was 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 better than that though. They do have one specifically at least that is trying to remove stuff. So some places at least do that. Um, how systematically did you measure the surface roughness? Was that just like playing around, or did you measure the surface roughness for each of the each of the surfaces that you measured? Yeah, um, no, it's it's essentially an average for the two types of plates. I just took. A subset. Well, actually, I think I might have done all of the plates because we only use like 12 of each. And then on each one did, I don't remember, five or six um, scans with the profilometer just randomly placed and then average it all together. This was like last minute, just at the end, we got, <laughs> as the paper was in review, we got a, a reviewer say, oh, well, you should take a profilometer and do this. And we said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll do it. So uh, we're going to, for the one we're doing now, we're actually going to engrave the back of the plates with like a serial number so we know what each one is. And afterwards, we can actually correlate the samples a lot more closely. Yeah, because that would be really interesting if yeah. you could come up with a correction factor based on surface roughness. Totally, then... yeah. And well, and also I was you know, thinking about, say you have like a wood surface that's sealed with poly or something. That's going to have a lot of like little ridges and bumps and stuff in it. That might be really hard to recover stuff off of. Right. <laughs> what happens when you finish early? <laughs> uh, do you see uh, temperature playing a factor at all? Surface temperature or ambient temperature? Um, just based on my experience with other adsorption desorption stuff, that definitely could happen. But the temperature range in these facilities is probably pretty narrow. Like, usually you'll see a difference between like zero Celsius and 50 Celsius or something, but we're not going to see temperature differences like that. So I would say potentially. And do you see any difference between the temperature you're testing it at versus what they would possibly have? It's possible. We are, yeah, we, we, you're right in that we didn't really control for that. We just called it room temperature and didn't worry about it. That's valid. Yeah, there are a lot of different grades of stainless steel out there, used industrially anyway. Yep. Um, have you thought about trying this on different grades of stainless? Uh, we have, and that was all, that was a, we got a, that comment from a reviewer as well in the paper. Um, that's just dictated by how much time we have to test stuff. But yeah, we, we are, we're thinking about that. Okay, I think uh, we'll let Maddie off the podium <laughs> over here, but thank you so much, Maddie. You're it was welcome. great.